Amen. Yeah, good morning. Man, it's good to see you, man. What a, what a day, huh? Watching uh, a whole family get baptized like that. Man, I'm ready to get moving. How about you, huh? Yeah. We are so glad you're here. Let me welcome everyone online as well. It's good to have you. We know that many of you are out there, and uh, today uh, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to uh, launch a new series. Uh, today's kind of a day of what I would call new beginnings, you know, right? I mean, today we, of course, we have uh, baptisms, which represents, as Kevin said, uh, spiritual life and what God has done in their hearts, and we rejoice as a church that way. And um, that's a new beginning. As I just said, a, uh, a new series. That's fun. We're going to start Ripples today. Uh, that's, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, and then we've opened up our children's ministry. Finally. Right? We've been able to do that. So we've been, we praise God. We've, uh, we've been working toward that for a while. And uh, Steph and her team have been working. So we're just so, so grateful. Okay? And as I said, uh, we're going to begin uh, our series called Ripples. And uh, it's really about the reality of what uh, the long-term effect of a life, a generation, can look like when we align ourselves with God's purposes, when we notice what he's doing and we join him in his work, and even when in our own uh, sense of, of what we believe should happen, even if it doesn't go that way, it doesn't put uh, the reality of the ripple effect of our lives in jeopardy. Because when we're centered in Christ, those things happen. And, and here's the crazy thing. Your life is really making a difference, uh, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Uh, and we are living ripples. And so we're going to talk about that through this, this series. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up talking about uh, this idea of reclaiming uh, your dream. Uh, we have dreams, uh, all of us, regardless of how old we are. I think, I think there's something in our soul and our spirits that says uh, we want to dream. We want to believe God can do more than even what we're seeing. And, and so that's part of us. Now, dreams are kind of funny, right? Uh, we kind of move in and out of our dreams a little bit at different times throughout our lives, don't we? Kind of revisit it and realize that this was true back then and maybe not now or now and not, the, you know, whatever. We kind of, uh, it, it's, it's been true uh, even in, um, in our daughter's life. Uh, we, we laugh about this. She has a, a boyfriend and uh, they were talking when they, they tell this story and we just laugh our heads off about it. But uh, they, they were talking one time pretty seriously uh, about uh, their lives and what they wanted their lives to stand for. And they began to talk about their dreams. And, and Emily in high school had dreams. And, and they, were, they were talking about being enough for each other and all this kind of stuff, as boyfriend and girlfriend do. And she said, you know what, Lawrence, just like me, I had this dream in high school, and then I let my dreams go, and I met you. <laughs> and, and so there, there was literally this, wait a minute right? You know, if you're a guy, you're like, man, I'm not sure I like that. But, but, but we joke about, you know, I gave up my dreams and I, now I meet you. And, you know, but some of you are that way in life, right? Like you, you, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of where you're at. Like you, you gave up your dreams and you feel like you've kind of settled for the consolation prize uh, in your life. And, and um, so I don't know if that's you or not, but some of us are there. Now, I want to talk to people that feel this way, but, but let me just make this clear as we talk about this. As a church, as followers of Jesus Christ, which I believe most of us are, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, we've prepared for you. And we want you to know that you have a seat at the table, and we want to introduce you to the one that's given his life for you. But as, as people of faith, we need to remember um, that the foundation of our lives, the foundation of any dream that God has given us, is the gospel. It's the truth of Christ in any of our lives, that, and the truth that we belong to Christ. In fact, the, the good news of the gospel is found over in Romans chapter 6. Uh, Paul, of course, is speaking, and he says in verses 22 and 23, it's up here on the screen, he said, he says, but now that you have been set free from sin. You see, we need, to, we need to remind ourselves as people of faith, as we belong to him, 
that this is true for us. That we were once before Christ in spiritual bondage, but because of great Christ's great love for us, because of his sacrifice on the cross for us, and then his resurrection through Christ, and in faith, we have been set free from sin. Isn't that the good news today? To understand that's the foundation. And we become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness. This is imparted to you, the holiness of Christ. And the result, Paul says, is eternal life. We have been given through Christ eternal life. We belong to him. For the wages of that sin is death, spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so two things that we learn, we learn right there as the foundation to be reminded. I'm a follower of Christ for so many years But I need to be reminded that we have passed from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. And that we're slaves to God. And so when we talk about ripples and we talk about reclaiming our dream, we don't come from a posture of what I deserve. And if the gospel is true and it's true, it definitely is true. If, if that is the case in us, if our dream is only about adding to our lives those things that we believe should be added, then God is not going to be excited about that. If that were the case, then God would be, and I've said this over the years, God would simply be a cosmic vending machine that we use for ourselves. That's not true. And so according to the gospel, the most rewarding, life-fulfilling, ripple effect lives will only be realized through a submission to his kingdom and his desire for us. And oh, what a joy that is. Why? Because our dream built our way. When it crumbles, we crumble. I've talked to many people over the years when we talk about things like dreams and we talk about vision and we talk about the things that that we want our lives to be and people have built and built and built everything centered upon them. If something happens to that thing and it crumbles, truth is they crumble because their God died. You see, when we build our dream on the foundation of ourselves, when it crumbles, we crumble. But when we build the foundation of our lives upon the gospel of who Jesus is, when we do that, when things crumble in our lives, we don't crumble. It's not okay, but we're okay. Why? Because the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope of our salvation, The joy that's set before us is never in question. And so when it crumbles, we struggle, we fight, we doubt, we grit our teeth, even ask why. But at the end of the day, our hope is secure. So when we talk about dreams and what we want to do, it's in that context that we can talk about this. And I don't want us to build it on anything else. Get it? Good. Online, get it? Good. So important. D.L. Moody made a a phrase, very famous. Everybody thinks that it started with D.L. Moody. It did not. It started with someone else years before him. And he said this. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do through one person who is fully committed to him. I think the actual word is consecrated to him or committed to him. The world is yet to see what God can do through one person who is fully committed to him. You know what that is? That's the ripple effect. That's a life built upon the truth of Jesus Christ and 
his death and resurrection, and through faith we belong to Christ. When a life is fully committed to him, the truth is the world has yet to see one who really, really is committed to him that way. And so the ripple effect that we're going to talk about is about a person. It's about a group of people seeking to be fully committed to him. And in that context, it's okay and it's appropriate to consider our lives and to ask good and honest questions of God. As long as we return to good sound doctrine and our answers. And so again, I'll return. Maybe you feel like you've settled for a consolation prize in your life. Let's talk about that. There's a couple in Scripture that feel just that way. It's Abraham and Sarah. It's all the way back in the book of Genesis. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to Genesis. Guess what? You can find this one. It's the very first book. Get right past the table of contents. Genesis is right there. You're there. So we're going to go to chapter 11, 12, and then we're going to go over to 15. And we're going to bounce around a couple places in the New Testament. And uh, Bring your Bibles. Practice finding those places. We want to be people of the Word, don't we? And so you practice bouncing around. Some people are like, nope, got my phone. Whatever. You can get there, okay? So go over to Genesis chapter 15. It's where we're going to be, Sarah and Abraham. Let me tell you what, kind of what's going on with them. And then we'll look at some verses um, and kind of set the context. Sarah and Abraham wanted to have children. Uh, most couples, not all, I don't want to say all people, but, but most people want to have children. And, and we're going to see here that they could not. Look, at over, look over in chapter 11, verse 30. Genesis records this. Now Sarah was childless because she was unable to conceive. Now I love to take scripture and try to try to bring it back to how people were kind of processing that because it's it's really easy for us as we read stories in the Bible and scripture to say, okay, that happened. And the reason we can just kind of gloss over it and kind of move on to the next thing is because we know the end of the story. Right? And so we can say, well, yeah, back there they couldn't, but look what happens here. And so we kind of dismiss how difficult that was. And in, in the context of Abraham and Sarah, when you would have a child, I mean, that was like your crown glory in that, that day and age. And, and they could not bear children. And so you know what it's like even now. Maybe, maybe you're, uh, you're a young couple and, and you're wanting to have children and you can't conceive. And this is what it feels like. I, I didn't have this struggle, and so I don't want to put myself in a, in, in a context that's unfair. But, but this is what I've, I've known to be true as I've spoken with people is that they want to have children. You want to have children. You can't. But it seems like everybody around you is getting pregnant. It seems like every, everything that, that you're trying to do doesn't work, but, but they're having the baby showers and, and they're making the announcements on social media and, and they're having the big parties and here you are in the background thinking, what about me? And I think that's what Abraham and Sarah were going through. They didn't have an heir. And being, having an heir back in that culture was huge. Having a child was as I said, you're crown, your crowning glory. And so they were struggling. Their, here it is. Their dream seemed to be dead. And there was nothing they could do about it. So with that context, we can keep moving, right? They're devastated. Then God comes into the picture. He speaks to them and he challenges them. Don't miss this. He challenges them to take a massive, a massive step of faith. Chapter 12, we'll look at verses 1 through 3, and then we'll skip down to verse 7. Okay? The Lord has, had said to Abram, who became Abraham, Sarai became Sarah, just so you know if you're new to the Scriptures. God said, go from your country, your people, and your father's household, to the land I will show you. So leave everything familiar 
nope, you don't really have a family, an immediate family yet. You can't have children yet. You're already devastated there. And now God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to up the ante. I want you to leave your home. Everything that's familiar. And then he says this. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And we're going to see how we're related to that in a minute. And hop down to verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, Two years, notice this, your offspring I will give this land. To your offspring. In other words, Abraham, Sarah, listen, I know, I know you're discouraged. I know you're devastated, but I am going to give you offspring. You're going to have children. And if you're Abraham and Sarah, you're like, let's go, baby. The word has been said. God has made the statement. He's made the promise. Let's go. We're going to the land. We're going to have kids. We're going to be blessed as a nation. Man, everything's coming around. All of the obedience back here. All of the faith back here. Everything that we've been doing, it's coming full circle. God's closing the loop. And we're going to have kids. And it's going to be amazing. And so i got to believe. Now, I'm adding a little bit to this. I'm not trying to take anything away from the scriptures. But I, this is just how people think. You got to believe on their journey that Abraham and Sarah are like, hey, what do you think he's going to look like? Man, I hope he doesn't look like me, because if he looks like you, that's better, because I'm not much of a looker. Right? They start talking about maybe names. They start talking about, you know, well, you, you just start, like, they're, 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 it, they, they think it's going to happen. A month goes by, and, and, and nothing happens. Two months, three months, four months, five months. And maybe at first they're saying, you know what? God promised. God's going to do it. Right? God's going to deliver. He, he said it. And so he's just, he's just building our faith. He's getting us ready. Months and months and months go by. Nothing. And I'm sure they practiced. I don't know. I just said that off the cuff. I probably shouldn't have. So Nothing happened for months and months and months, right? Now, go over to Genesis chapter 15. Verse 1 says this, after this, if you have your Bibles, mark that in your Bibles. The NLT says, sometime later, the New Living Translation. The NIV says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Now, I just want to stop there for a second. After this, New Living Translation, sometime later. So in Genesis 12, right, well, Genesis 11, you have a struggle, right? Genesis 12, you have a promise. And then you jump all the way to chapter 15, the problem's still there. They don't have children yet. You look at after this or sometime later, theologians will tell you, and we can go back and study this, it was no less than 10 years between the promise and, of chapter 12 and the reality of chapter 15. No less. Some theologians argue that it was much longer. But let's just work with the minimum. At least... 120 months. God made a promise. God was giving them their dream, so they thought, and nothing. Some of you have your own version of this story. God, where are you? God, you promised. God, I really believe that you gave me this dream. You have your own version. Maybe I didn't hear you right. God, did you forget about me? You see, from Abraham's point of view, nothing was happening. 
There was a promise and a lot of time, but no evidence of God working. Go to verse 2 with me. I'll read the rest of verse 1. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Right? Everything had crumbled. But God comes back and reminds them, if your foundation is in me, we've talked about that, you're going to be all right. Then the verse 2. But Abram said, which is what I would say, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? God, you're a fine reward, but I thought I was getting a boy. Now, what's interesting, remember back in chapter 12? God said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Your offspring are going to explode. Abraham heard the large, but by the time he got to chapter 15, he was just settling for just a child. I don't need a nation. Just give me a child. You see, what happens when we are struggling with, with moving forward in our lives, what we tend to do is we tend to think singular. God, just do this one thing. But God is always thinking plural. Now, it's not to say God is not a pluralistic God, but in the way that he works, we think singular, he thinks plural, meaning that you're going to experience the one thing, but God is connecting that one thing to the many things. God is bigger. God is all about the ripple effect when it comes to him accomplishing his purposes in life, and we get to be a part of that. Abraham limited his perspective, and he just said one thing, just one thing. It used to be many. I'll just settle for the one. God says, wait a minute. I'm your great reward. My promise hasn't changed. I am God. I don't change. Just hang tight with me. He's always about the many things. Go over to Matthew chapter 13. It's a parable of the sower. He talks about the soils and things like that. But look down at verse 8. He, still, he said, still other seed fell on good soil. Notice this. Where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. We think, throw a seed, get a bush. God says, throw a seed, I'm going to grow a garden. Thirty, sixty, even a hundred times. You see, when we decide, don't miss this, don't miss this, so it's so huge. When we decide to align ourselves with God's purposes and his direction and what he is doing in the world, God creates a ripple effect. And even if it looks different than what we thought the dream was going to be, he still invites you into himself and his work and our, our lives becomes something that matters to generation to generation, even if it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Even if it wasn't accomplished the way that we thought it should be accomplished. Years ago, I remember doing a study, and most of you won't even know who this guy is. His name is Henry Blackaby, and he's a great theologian. He's much older now. But he did a book called Experiencing God. And I'll never forget this. Out of everything that we studied in that book, he said, listen, so many people are trying to figure out what the will of God is, where I'm supposed to go, when really what we're called to do is to discover and pursue and find out where God is working already and then join him in the work. And when that happens, there's a fully alive, foundationally strong person in Christ. And when it crumbles, you don't crumble because your foundation is in Jesus, even though it's difficult. 
even though it's different. We are yet to see what God can do through a life fully committed to him. Now let me just take a quick minute and look at the shadow side of this. Because that's good teaching, meaning not me, but from the scriptures teaching us that. Gives us hope and confidence. But some of you, and how you're really feeling, is that you feel like you're settling for a consolation prize because you've been believing that God would do something and he hasn't that he would hear your prayer, that he would bring a miracle, that he would provide provision, and it doesn't seem like he has. But remember, the principle of the seed. Just because you don't see fruit above the ground doesn't mean there's something, doesn't mean there's not something going on underneath the ground. You see, Did God stop working in Abraham and Sarah's life over the 120 months? No. But to his and hers limited perspective, did it appear that way? Yes. But God came back and said, Abraham, easy big fella. I am your great reward. And I'm going to do what I promised. Sometimes us waiting is the opportunity for us to really, really dig into who we are in the person of Jesus Christ. Get it? Good. Now let's go back to Abraham. He had that limited perspective. Go to uh, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 15. Love this, guys. This is what we need to learn today. And I'll try to wrap it up here in a minute. Then the word of the Lord, chapter 15, did I say that? Four and five. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man, meaning the guy Eleazar, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. 120 months later, maybe longer. God comes back to the same promise. And then notice this. He took him outside. Now just leave it out there for a second. He took him outside. So where was he? Inside. He was in a tent, his tent. I don't know. But he was inside. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall be your offspring. Now, just think about that for a second. Abraham, hey, you in there? Hey, come here. I want to show you something. Look up. See that? That's going to be my promise to you. I think that one of the reasons that we as people lose our tenacity for Jesus is because we spend so much time in the tent not seeing what he is doing, not trying to see what he's doing, not recognizing that he loves us and he's still working, and our view gets limited. We have poor perspective And I think sometimes God is saying, and by the way, you need one another to tell you this, to grab you and say, get out of your tent and look up at the stars. God is not dead. He has not stopped working. You can't even count what he's doing. I don't know what Abraham did when this happened. When he said, so shall be your offspring. I don't know what I would have done. I don't know if I would have said, dude, that's awesome. I wouldn't have said that. Because he'd be like, what? 
Maybe he fell down in worship. Maybe he, I, I don't know. But all of a sudden, the loop began to be closed on God's promises. Listen, for those of you who belong to Christ, I hope you understand that you're one of those stars. Go over to Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Which promise? The one that happened back in Genesis chapter 12. We're part of that. I'm a star. Unbelievable. See, Abraham was thinking about having a son, singular. God was thinking about us. That's just unbelievable to me. So this message is for those of you who have maybe given up on God or at least at very minimal lowered your expectations or whatever. But listen, with all I've said, look at Romans 8, 28. I'll just put it on, I'll read it on the screen because I'm going to get done. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Is God not working in difficulty? Of course he is. Then go over to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. So let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Abraham, I am your great reward. I know you're tired, but don't grow weary in the sense of your belief in my promise. Your belief in my work. Your belief in who I am. And who you are to me. I've called you. You're my own possession. And if that's the case, things work out for the glory of God. It's so powerful because I know that our God is working. It's powerful because I know that our God is with us, that our God is for us. He is the God of salvation. He is the God of forgiveness. He is the God of breakthroughs. He is the God of miracles. His promises are true. One more and I'll quit. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I'm going to give you an assignment. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is work, it is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ. Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Those verses read differently when you connect them to how his promise started with Abraham in chapter 12, don't they? Through generation to generation to generation. It's the ripple effect. It's reclaiming our dream for what God has done. So here's what I want you to do. We'll pray. Some of you just need to work at getting out of your tent, right? I'll tell you to do a couple things. Number one, I hope you're in life groups. I hope that if you're able to, if you're able to, with there's health concerns, all those things, all that's going on. I'm not saying anything about those who can't be here. That's why church is so important, though. Because I need people to encourage me in corporate worship and and fellowship and rubbing shoulders in the lobby and maybe praying for one another. We need to be here if we can. Okay? You need to be in life groups. Because we've got to pull each other out of the tent. Right? God uses us that way. 
The second thing I would tell you is this. You need to get alone and you need to write out the things that you know God has been always been faithful in, in your life. I try to do this about once a quarter in my life because I get overwhelmed by the tent that's around me. And I have to write down in my own quiet time, God, I've seen you do this and this and this. Wow, yep, this and this. Okay, you are working. And it helps you see the stars. Helps me reclaim the dream he's given me. And my life begins to make sense in the sense of his purposes through me. And I'm reclaiming my dream. Get it? Good, let's pray. Father, thank you for the beginning of the series and working in and through us. We give you glory for your word and the truth that's shared in it. Uh, Lord, um, we will align ourselves forever with what your word says. Thank you for the hope that we have, the joy that's available to all that know him. We love you. And may your word today serve as an encouragement to all the souls that, um, that need it today. For your glory and your name. Amen.